Hey there, I'm Matt Wilhelmy. I'm the owner of Strategic Voyages Business Consultants. We are a fractional CFO firm providing CFO services to businesses that don't have a full-time CFO. And today I'm joined with Mark Repkin, who is the principal of Mark Repkin and Associates, sales advisory firm concentrating on helping sales leaders close the gap between high performers and low performers. Hey, Mark, thanks for joining me again. Yep, no, it's been fun. So just to kind of recap our first episode, we dived into this particular issue where this uh, organization does B2B sales and B2C sales. Um, they've got about seven to eight salespeople on their team. They do about $10 million a year, but they're in kind of a sales slump. And that is where, you know, when I was thinking about this issue, I was like, man, I got to talk to Mark because I bet he's seen this. I bet he's been there and done this. And so we were kind of clarifying the problem a little bit and you brought up some really, really good points. Um, you know, perhaps it isn't a sales problem. Maybe it's a lead problem. And, you know, in the break, we were kind of talking about maybe some other issues. Do you want to maybe outline some of those? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I just punched you right between the nose. If you were the client and I'd say, maybe the issue is the leadership. Maybe there's a complacency. Maybe there is a lack of conviction and a lack of, of real uh, drive to want to fix this problem. Like people want to, you know, people say they want to do stuff. And, and then what they do is they focus on the, the why they can't do it. And they say, yeah, we can't do that, but we can't do that. But, and I, and, and I would like to flip that on its head and saying, as a sales leader and as a business owner, everything with sales stagnancy and slumps start with the leader. So we got to look at the leadership mentality and understand the question of what type of sales culture are they driving? And I could define that out for you if you like. Yeah, I think that's an interesting topic. You know, I think about the sales team as, as being a leader or leader driven uh, process as well. Um, and I do have to kind of maybe wonder when I'm talking to these, these folks, where is the leadership? What is the direction of the sales team? Is there a sales campaign that we're embarking on? What is the sales goals? You know, I'm not the sales guru. That's why we're talking to you, Mark. But I, I have these kind of things in the back of my head that I've heard about. I, I think good organizations do these things, but maybe they're not. And so then the leaders do need to look in the mirror and, and they might not like what they see. Yeah, you know, um, and in and, and the couple of conversations you and I have had, um, having a, a chief financial officer that, that can look at the sales issue from the lens of a revenue and a financial side, it's critical because you bring a perspective to the conversation that maybe the sales leadership or ownership doesn't have. And it's in the questions that we can really, and especially the questions that hurt. It's like, that's when I'm consulting, uh, when I'm looking and talking to someone, I look and see when they strain but this seems to me like when I define sales culture, um, I think about things like about what encompasses that, the beliefs of the leader and the sales culture itself. What are their values and what are the behaviors of the sales team? And if you think about it, what we think about, what we believe, what we value, those drive the um, actually what we do and what we do impacts what results we get. And so I'm wondering if this is well below the surface issue that there isn't some sort of a, uh, a block that is preventing, it's a friction that's preventing the wanting to grow. We talked about the idea earlier about expanding offering. Have, had, had, and we don't have to get into the details, but what, do you think they'd be receptive to expanding an offering? Or are they saying, no, we can't do that because? Well, I think the change is hard. And a lot of times, especially because I know that the owner of this company, um, who's also the sales leader, uh, is 72 years old. And yeah. I'm not saying that to talk poorly about anybody in their 70s. My dad is 72 years old, um, but he doesn't like to change either. And I think there might be a little bit of resistance with um, you know, this idea of maybe expanding the offerings because that's not the way that they do things, which is like my least favorite thing to hear. It's almost like nails on a chalkboard. Well, we've always done it this way. So we're just going to keep doing it this way. It's like, yeah. well, but if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. And it, you don't it, like it, what you got. Yeah, right. So, and, 
Let, listen to what you're saying because the, what you just described is I have an ideal of that I want growth, but my current reality is we're stagnant and we're sliding back, but I don't want to change. Like the, the contradiction in that is just, it's like palpable. Yeah. So I've got a, a sales story that's a little bit tangential. So stick with me here. But uh, a company called me a few years ago because they said they had a problem with sales. Mm -hmm. And I told them right off the gate, I'm not the sales guy. Uh, I wish I'd known you at the time, Mark. I would have told them to call you. But um, the owner of the company is like, well, Matt, just, you know, you're a business consultant. I, I bet you could see some things. Would you come on out to the company? Um, maybe just spend a day. Let us know what you think. We'll pay you for your time and all that. I'm like, okay, I, I guess. So I go out there. I'm, I'm talking to his team. I'm, I'm meeting the people. I'm taking lots of notes. I present him with a proposal to fix his sales. And um, again, I wish I would have known you. You probably would have done a way better job. But he says, no, thanks. Like, okay. I mean, I just, you know, whatever. I mean, you asked me to come out. Um, you, you wanted my help. Well, what ended up happening is about four months later, Mark, he called me back and says, Matt, um, I know I was talking to you about sales and I know I said I didn't need any help, but now I'm having a hard time making payroll. Can you help me out? It's like, well, what? The, your problem wasn't sales if in four months you can't make payroll. You have a lot of other issues going on there. And so, um, you know, I ended up helping him with payroll and we ended up, my, uh, my partners and I did a lot of different work for him to kind of revive his company. But it's almost, the reason I pulled that story is because it seems like people maybe don't want to admit how bad of an organizational problem they have. Mm -hmm. And they just want to say, ah, I've heard sales fixes it. Everybody will be happy when revenue is up everything's going to work out well when we're making tons of money. And I think, and I bet you could probably relate that doesn't always fix the problem. Yeah. I, the, the reason that story hits home is that when I'm working with sales leaders and that sales leader could be the business owner who like in this case where they also are the person running sales or could be actually a professional VP of sales or sales manager. The number one thing that we have to get to is a ability to hit a objective reality. Objective mm. reality is binary. It's up, it's down, it's black, it's white, it's good, it's bad. But in order to get there, you have to be able to be vulnerable. It's a word that's not often used in business, but vulnerability is so important, both in sales, but especially leadership, because you, you know, the, the, you spend all this time trying to project to the world how powerful and how professional you are, but it's through the vulnerability that will lead to the growth. So I bet you in this person's, in this issue, that, that example you just shared, when they called you the first time, it wasn't that your ideas were probably bad or may have even been what they were thinking themselves, but they weren't willing to be vulnerable and say to you, Matt, I really have an issue. And they waited four months until the point that it was a point of no return or certainly was going to take a lot more. Imagine what would have happened in that same situation if they would have said to you, Matt, listen, the door is closed and I want to just tell you like from the heart, this is where I suck. The power of saying I suck here. We're not good at this. We're extraordinary at this. I'm awesome at this but I suck here. I mean, sorry for the language, but I, it's that kind of raw. And if you can get to that point, you can actually make magic happen. But if you can't get there, it's it's not, it's not. going to be built on a foundation of facade. It's just fluff. Yeah, so, I mean, that's an interesting um, you know, way of maybe being vulnerable. And I, I have maybe developed um, that skill set because I do think it's a skill set to almost get people to open up to you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, Mark, as you've, you know, kind of thinking back over some of the clients that you've helped or maybe tried to help and they haven't taken your advice or maybe they didn't hire you or it was a, they didn't do it all the way. I mean, um, what are some of those cautionary tales? Like, do those businesses end up working out? Do they just figure it out on their own? I mean, how does that even, can you figure this out on your own? Yeah. Um, the cautionary tales are when we when we talk about uh, the problems that we're having, it's usually in the complaint. Um, you know, I 
you know, we're, our, our teams are not collaborating. It can be more effective. And well, what's the impact of that? Well, we're missing, you know, we're not, we're missing the opportunity for people to learn from each other. Um, our sales reps aren't, aren't motivated. Well, that's an interesting one. That's a big mistake because you can't motivate anybody. Motivation comes intrinsically. What you can do is you can reinforce. And so it sounds like that in that case that they have a, that they have a misunderstanding of what levers to push on and they try tactical things. I just had a conversation, a sales leader um, in um, called me up and he, and he says, we want to give them CRM compliance. We have to get them to fill this stuff out in the CRM and they don't want to do it. So I'm going to offer them a $5 Starbucks gift card for every time that they, they do this, they meet the goal. I'm like $5 gift card. Well, that's, trying to push motivation on them, but they never ask the question of what does the performer want? And is that really what the issue is? Because in the absence of intrinsic motivation, you have to always yield with extrinsic motivation, which means money and, and prizes and rewards. And the problem with those things are, and uh, I think that they're perfect in the right positioning, but if you're using it to solve the root issue, you run into entitlement issues, escalation issues, and you also run into the problem of, I don't really care about Starbucks. I hate Starbucks. I don't want to do that. And the, and guess what happens? I'll only do it when I get the Starbucks gift card, as opposed to the issue of trying to get to the problem, which is, have we really tapped into this individual performer's motivation intrinsically on what their goals are and what they're trying to accomplish in their life and why they're working here and how, through that understanding, we can help them connect the needs of the company and by providing for the needs of the company, we meet their own goals and we get them to a point of a why. This is why we need you to do these things. And so when we try to dangle stuff out there, Matt, and I'm giving you an example through motivation because it seems so obvious, but when we dangle things out there like those carrots, but we haven't really addressed the issue, we're just putting ourselves into a rocking chair of oscillating back and forth Oh, we're doing great. Oh, it sucks. Oh, we're doing great. Oh, it sucks. Whereas if we address the issues, the real issues, we can actually put it on wheels and we can move things forward. So That's I don't know great, Mark. Work all, but <laughs> swear my head well, no, I, I, so I just, I, I'm taking lots of notes. Um, I feel like I'm drinking from a fire hose. So um, you said that you need to be objective with reality and perhaps there's no vulnerability in the leadership. And then you used a, a term, which I, have often used, which is we have to get to the why. We have to understand why the salespeople aren't doing what we asked them to do, or um, the bottom, you know, the root cause of some of these issues, not the surface level stuff. Um, that's really great. That's rich. Yeah. Um, so I I'm curious, Mark, if you can think about a time when you met a company that was saying that they wanted to change, and then when you recommended some things that they could do to change. I didn't want to do it. Is that has that ever happened? Uh, I would hope it has. Just from thinking about the the percentages, right, of people who say they want to change, maybe it's you know they they just got a new gym membership and they say they're going to go and they don't go. You know the numbers show that. Or people say they want to get their finances fixed and they go and meet with a financial advisor and then they don't save any money. I mean, there's there's these stories of people who say they want to change and then they don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's it. I'm, I'm going to just go with the first one that came to mind. I don't know if this is the best example, but she, um, president of a company, um, uh, revenue probably six to seven million. Okay. The growth goal was to get to like 15, 20 over a course of three to five years. They wanted to move out of their current offices into more of a downtown location. They wanted a lofty type thing. She was very motivated to have young people working for her. Uh, she had the, you know, the vision of the loft and the young energized sales team. And uh, she brought me in and we worked together for a year. And in that year, we were, I was constantly met with resistance uh, for change. And the biggest thing that she didn't want to change was her influence on sales. She brought in people that actually were professionals and knew what they were doing, but they were afraid to act because she was in the uh, point of authority. And 
So I had to have that, that deep conversation with her and saying, again, the problem is not them, even though she was pointing at them. The problem is you. And it's not the fact that she wasn't brilliant. She was, she is brilliant. She's amazing. I mean, she can outsell most anybody. But the thing that, the thing that I, um, I don't even want to use her name, but the thing that she lacked was a self-awareness about her control and authority that she had over people. And, and everybody was afraid to move because they didn't mm -hmm. know, because here's what would happen. If they made a decision, even if it was the right decision, she would question it with the word, why? Why did you do that? It was accusatory, as opposed to just asking the question of, what was the basis of your choice there? Help me understand why you made that choice. And so we worked with her on relinguaging her authority to a superpower, which said, get rid of the word why, change it with the word what. What was your thinking? What, take, walk me through your steps. How did you come to that? And at some point, she could then get to this point and saying, in her mind, that was really smart or that was not so smart. And if it was smart, then I gave her an assignment of let's reinforce them. Let's tell them how, how really smart that was and how she's appreciative that they took the initiative. And then if it wasn't so smart, rather than telling them that the saying, ask them saying, have you considered this or this or this? And then so instead of giving the answers, ask the questions to elicit the answers. And as a result, guess what happened? Things changed through the word why to what? That's the first example that came to mind about someone that resisted change, but eventually adapted it and then saw the results of their effort. Yeah, I mean, Mark, that's great. That's a really interesting story because I think a lot of us, uh, maybe as first time leaders, do lack that self awareness that you talked about. And it reminds me of um, a lot of different, you know, uh, experts will will tell you that just because someone is a great salesperson and they're charismatic and they're engaging and they're likable and funny and all these different things um that doesn't make them a good leader that doesn't make them a great leader of people and a people developer and that's not to say that you can't take any salespeople and make them a leader of course you can but not often and not without intentionality of of improving, you know, it's a very different skill set going from a salesperson or professional to sales leader. Well, you so know, that's an interesting um, Matt, caveat there you brought up. So thank you for that story. Um, we're gonna um, shift gears here in our next segment. We're gonna get yep. back to our original case study. We're gonna talk about some solutions and strategies for this uh, company we've been talking about. Again, I'm here with Mark Repkin principal of Mark Repkin and Associates. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing about your solution and uh, perhaps some strategies for this case study that we're talking about. Stay tuned.